I, I, I introduced myself as having you were there this morning, okay, that um, <clears throat> I graduated from Catholic University in 1949, couldn't find a job initially, and then finally landed one at the Naval Research Laboratory in a group called the Rocket Sond, S-O-N-D-E branch, and they were in charge of doing upper atmosphere research. And I said to myself, my God, and they're gonna pay me too. <laughs> no, I'm not, not joking, because I would stay there till midnight and work. It was a great job. Uh, the initial part I was being trained when to was uh, being manager of the payload, in which uh, you, you had to design a wiring diagram using car batteries as the battery source for those rocket shots. And <clears throat> so it, you had to design a, a wiring diagram that was a length of this table and, tw and twice as wide. And then trace, spend days tracing that for any sh uh, short circuits. It was, I w and I learned how to do all that. So then we'd wire up the rocket and then we'd uh, grab the experimenters grab the um, boxes from the experimenters. One wanted to measure the atmosphere, one wanted to measure the cosmic rays, another one wanted to measure the ionosphere. They were all different uh, uh, tests, and they went into the nose. And a, a big one was always studying the sun. The sun is so bright, it, it takes the smallest camera you can have to, to get all the data off of the sun. So that was my job at the beginning, was the payload manager. And then I got assigned to a guy, uh, we, we were designing more electronics. And we, we came to a point, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff, I said, where in 1955, uh, we were assigned by the President of the United States to design a satellite program called Vanguard. And that Vanguard was our proposal to put a first, for a first time, a satellite in orbit, and uh, the Russians did the same thing. When I was, what I read, just read in there was one day later, they said they would do that. Uh, and as everybody knows, they beat us to the punch in getting the first one up there. Um, and so this morning, one of the things that we did with Vanguard was design a tracking system, and it was called Minitrack. At that, in those days, uh, electronics that, uh, s s uh, uh, that existed didn't go higher than 108 megacycles. So we could land, we could make an oscillator at 108 megacycles. The very top end of the FM band had not been assigned to anybody. It was assigned to Vanguard. And the first satellite that was uh, built was then to operate at 108 megacycles. Uh, previously, in 1952, we had done some research in interferometer tracking. Uh, there is a system at the Cape called uh, Azusa, and it uses a, a system at 5,000 megahertz. And these, if you place antennas, uh, well, I'm just going to explain ours. Uh, our antennas were separated by 500 feet, which is 50 wavelengths at 108 megacycles. There were two antennas east-west, two antennas north-south, and then some antennas that are closer to resolve the ambiguity of your measurements in the big one. So the, that's 50 wavelengths apart. And as a satellite travels over that station, where is he? He went away. Using two arms. You get two rays from the satellite that are 500 feet apart. And this ray arrives earlier than that one. Okay, can you see that difference? So if you draw a perpendicular, you get the cosine of the angle, which then determines the angle to the satellite by just measuring the difference in the length. So one signal arrives now, and the other one arrives a little later. And we could measure that difference, the 
phase difference by a special method called double local oscillator um, to a Nat's eyebrow. We actually had 20 seconds of arc accuracy of doing that. We recorded that on strip charts, which had eight channels, and then a timing channel at the bottom to tell us the time at which we're making a recording, very similar to the EKGs. And th three of them, and then we, we would divide, we would... Um, I got your whiteboard. Oh, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> oh, in case you need it. All right. Um, so uh, we also digitized the phase difference. Now just think, the wavelength at 108 megacycles is 10 feet. We could measure that to 1% accuracy, so that's one foot of, of difference, um, just using the strip charts. And then we digitized that, and we could actually measure it to a tenth of a foot, the, the difference in the arrival of the signal. And satellite's moving pretty rapidly. At the, when, it, when it's overhead, it's moving at about one degree per second. So it's a rapid motion. And the whole pass, if it's directly over, will last maybe about 15 minutes. So and the satellite had a transmitter at the 108 megacycle. Um, we built the first station in Blossom Point, Maryland, 35 miles south of here. And that was our training station as well as the first one where we could uh, uh, do, do all the research and check out everything. All the electronics were put in a trailer and we packed everything in electronics and we got the different countries to agree to put a tracking station in. It was for free. We would give them the tracking station, they would supply the manpower. Okay? And they loved it because um, the stations were, would you believe, um, uh, Cuba? before Castro took over, and the first station was in the, on the airport. When he took over, we got the hell out of there. <laughs> we, we left all the equipment. And we, we, the State Department said, get out of there. Um, that station then later was moved, a new one was built in, uh, in uh, Florida. So we had one in uh, Blossom Point, Florida, Quito, Ecuador, Lima, Peru, Anafagasta, Chile, Santiago, Chile. It's actually all on the 75th meridian, and would having a, a chain of stations like that, every orbit would pass over some station. So you were able, and the orbits at that time were about 300 miles high, and it took, uh, the, the, the period was about 95 minutes. So every 95 minutes, we could track. We also got Australia involved. They loved it. They wanted a station, so there was one in Australia, and there was one in Alaska, and one in near London, England. Um, I'm the guy that had, was, was given the job of calibrating. I didn't explain any of that earlier today. So to calibrate them, we used an airplane to simulate a satellite. And in the base bottom of the airplane, there was loaded a flat printed circuit antenna about three feet by three feet, and in the center, a flashing light, a photo flash at the time, unheard of, okay? So we invented the flashing lights that you see in airplanes today. And, um, that, and we, tra we, we had a, a, a timing system called serial decimal time code. Um, it was a digital clock and it would put out a tick every second, and then s additional ticks every tenth of a second. If you count those additional ticks, you'd get the time of day of the first tick. So tick, 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 tick. That would be 21 and 30 seconds, something like that. All accurate to a tenth of a second. The, the clocks were synchronized to WWV and worldwide, we accounted for the transmit time to all the stations. We were good to about a millisecond of time all around the world, which was doing pretty good. We were really as good as WWV at that time. We, we used their, their electronics, too, so the same thing. Um, 
uh, where, where am I? At? Tracking the airplane and um, transmitting that tick signal to the airplane and flashlight on the ground, we had an astronomical camera. It was really uh, uh, reconnaissance cameras during World War II. They were eight inch diameter lens with a focal length of 40 inches. And they were mounted in an empty barrel that was put on a fork, which we would rotate at the opposite rotation of the earth. And the angle of the earth of the fork was at the um, north-south pole, parallel to that. So basically, we were canceling out the rotation of the earth. And you would get, like astronomers, a stop picture of the sky, of the stars. So, and when and we and the camera had a eight inch by eight by eleven inch glass plate. That was the film. So you would expose that uh, for about a minute or two while the airplane passed. We had to guide it by talking to the pilot. Got it straight across the middle of the station. So at the same time, they're transmitting. It's transmitting a signal that's being recorded in the trailer. And at the same time, you're optically recording the position of the airplane. That calibration system, I was, was the designer of that one with the help of astronomers, uh, Dr. Paul Harrigan. Um, he, he proposed the idea. Um, we were accurate to the size of the bulb at five miles away. And so we knew where the airplane was. We knew where the transmitter was. And we'd feed that data into the computer program, and that would uh, tell us that then any measurement made on the charts will correspond to a certain angle of the satellite. We were good to 20 seconds of arc, uh, which was the, uh, actually ninth, optical good. Huh? Ninth magnitude star, how you're using well, those charts? Well, we're coming to that one. Okay. He wants me to say. So to, to do this, star stuff. I had to become an astronomer, sort of. And we, 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 when you looked around, you didn't have catalogs that were the universe, all the stars in the universe. It turns out that different universities uh, make logs of the stars that they could see. So Yale had the Yale catalog, and um, Germany had its catalog, and Argentina had its catalog. We gathered them all, and we were the first ones to put a complete universe catalog together. It was about 10 inches high. And so, and then we, we worked in concert with uh, New Mexico College back there, where they, their students, which uh, were adjacent to White Sands Proving Grounds, had a lot of students that needed work, and they would uh, either decipher data for you and so forth. They did all the data reduction. We bought two, uh, you, two IBM 650s. I'm trying to remember names, that's great. A 650 machine was a big box and one of the first computing machines. Bought them one, bought us one, and uh, they would use all, and we bought um, machines that would measure the position of the star to one micron accuracy uh, on, a, on a moving thing. All of that done in the same three year period from start to the first launch. We built the stations, we built the, we moved them overseas, we built the, the calibration method and, and everything for about $125 million. Also the three, the redesign, designing the three axis Vanguard satellite. Now what he wants me to say is uh, that was the first universe catalog. And back then tape hadn't even been invented. So it was done on punch cards. We, 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 we had the, the uh, Washington DC observatory punch all those numbers to the ninth magnitude, 300,000 stars. And that was the first full catalog of 300,000 stars done. Took a year to just type in the stuff on a punch card. During the summer, 
I hired students from colleges and had them make four copies of the 300,000 punch cards. I spent, they had a lot of fun doing that. And gave one back to Dr. Herbert, so he had one for free. Later, the, the, the first method of recording was wire. I don't know if anybody remembers that. But, uh, remember wire? Yeah, you broke the wire. And then came tape. And we converted then the punch cards to a tape. And we gave it to the Congressional Library. And that was the first time anybody could access a universe catalog. So that was one of the products of just the Vanguard program. And today, you, you, you got it on your cell phone, Mama. <laughs> so, um, now, the mini-track interferometer um, w w became very accurate. There was an optical system being built by Harvard that used 20-inch lens cameras. They came late, and the only thing they could do was track the satellite when it's illuminated by the sun, the morning and the evening. And, uh, and they had a method of, of putting time on, on that track. Um, and the one story I tell is uh, I was in Africa turning on that station. That's right, Johannes asked, we put a station in there. And this was Easter. I spent six weeks there turning on the station and, and, and certifying it. So we had a big opening ceremony and they took the, the, the big wheels to the optical site and those astronomers had been taught by Whipple, Whipple was the astronomer in Harvard, that the mini track system was invented to tell the spotters and now the spotting system was a bunch of people with small telescopes at different angles. And they would, they, and so in the evening, they would freeze their eyes in there. And if they saw the satellite, they would yell. And that would be the angle for the 20 inch camera to be turned to so it could record the thing. So Minitrack fed the spotters the angles to look at, and the camera was good. And the 20, and the 20 inch it was only good to 20 seconds of R as it turned out. So then came my turn for the group to come. And there was a satellite live, and it was crossing over, and it was drawing this sawtooth. And each motion from 0 to 360 degrees, and 360 and 0 are the same number. So the thing would pop down, and that's why it was a sawtooth type motion. I told them each time the sawtooth occurred, um, that was uh, one degree of motion of the satellite. And we're digitizing that to one part per thousand. Right? That's 3.6 seconds of arc. They nearly dropped, uh, the astronomers. They quit and they joined Goddard, and the guy and his wife. <laughs> so they became astronomers at Goddard Space Flight Center. So we were very good. And, and mini track system was a super accurate method. Um, I'm emphasizing that because that's something I don't think you've been exposed to. It, uh, it, oper it, was, it was all done in vacuum tubes, by the way. There was no uh, electronics back probably, then. Probably sounded better. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> probably sounded better. <laughs> um, we, those stations stayed live. Uh, well, the, the final, there was a race between us, and we finally got our satellite up on St. Patrick's Day because that was uh, the, our, the, our, the director of all of us was an Irishman. So every St. Patrick's Day, we got a double celebration. Vanguard satellite number one, which was a, a little ball. Now, I told the story of everyone else about the ball falling out. Yes, nobody there. Okay, so, um, trying to figure out where I'm going. Did you mention the part about the um using the seesaw to calibrate and make the pilot go crazy? Uh, not yet, no, no, no. Is that still part coming, yeah. or is that Well, when, when you do a calibration like that, by the way, I became co-pilot in the fighter plane. I still have my helmet from it. 
Um, so we were all allowed to do that. It was, it was a propeller-driven fighter plane at Anacostia Field here in Washington, D.C. And in different places, the embassies always had DC-3s assigned to them. So we used them in uh, South America, the, the local airplanes. We had one four, we had a, um, I was going to try and think of the, um, the one that was kind of gull-shaped airplane, a four, four, four motor airplane, a big one. And we flew that to Quito, Ecuador. Quito, Ecuador was at 10,000 feet altitude. The station, my, uh, the funny story there, Bud, Buck Schrader was my boss. He was assigned to go find locations to put the stations. He got to Quito, Ecuador, and he was got what we call Montezuma's Revenge. <laughs> and so they were showing him the two places they were going to, one. one was going to be on the equator, and they showed him the worst one first. It was at the base of a volcano, 12,000 feet altitude. He says, great. That's, that's where we'll put it. Let's go back to the hotel. <laughs> so we were stuck for that for years. <laughs> and this volcano was supposed to erupt every 50 years. You know what? It hasn't erupted yet. And that's been almost 100 years. Um, so that was one of the funny stories. The, um, what was, what would you, you mentioned? The calibration with the uh, making the pilot fly the, crazy and then figuring out the seesaw? Th this is a little more complicated, but um, when the pilot flies directly over the station, he's flat like this. But we have to make 10 runs every 10 degrees. 10 degrees here, 10 degrees here, 10 degrees here. So the plane had to be at a tilt, and you couldn't fly the, the, the straight line a circle while tilted. So you have to be horizontal level. Now I, I built a, a one meter interferometer and transmitted the signal to the airplane. We, 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 we did, redid the receivers in the Navy airplane. They never tuned them up enough. So we had to retune them. And we transmitted this signal to the airplane to, for the flashing lights. But I also transmitted the output of this one meter interferometer and put it on a, knee, on a mirror, on a meter in front of him. And I said, keep the needle at the middle. He keeps the needle at the middle, he flies straight across. When, he, when we had to move him over 10 degrees, I would tilt the pair of antennas by 10 degrees and keep the needle in the middle, keep the needle in the middle. And so we, we conquered that. Now, so in effect, we had a system that was drawing roads in the sky, 25,000 feet altitude, straight lines, just with this, with this interferometer method. It's really a neat thing. That, uh, I remember at that time, me thinking, we were dropping atom bombs in, in, in a wee talk, and one of them was dropped seven miles off target. Anybody? You keep nodding, you got all this up. It was drop, being dropped. I said, we ought to give them our interferometer system so they could fly straight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what should I hit next? Okay, um, tracking and data relay satellite. I covered that earlier. And, um, but how many are new to this afternoon? Not too many. Um, the, the tracking, when, uh, when we were playing, whew, where do I go? One of the things we, uh, we designed was a thing called the Goddard Range and Range Rate. It was, uh, yeah, let's do that. And when Apollo was flying, it, it did two things. One, you, you put the astronauts in orbit around the Earth at about a couple of hundred miles high. And when everything was working fine, you shot them off to the moon. Okay. So while they were in this orbit, we had about 25 ground stations, three ships, six flying airplanes. And yet, 
we only covered them for 20% of the time of the orbit, mainly because the ocean is so huge. So by the time we finished, um, we said we've got to do better with man flight, and that was d done with the shuttle. So this satellite is con consists of two dishes. Each of these are 16 feet diameter. They were built by Harris Corporation in Melbourne, Florida, and the, and the, the yeah. mesh in here oh, wow. is done by manufacturers who make stockings for girls, mm -hmm. okay? And it's a, it's a double type mesh. I have a big old version of that. Actually, before you show that, people, does anybody yeah. recognize that? Who lives in the area? I've seen that before. Yeah, I've seen the Aerospace Museum? Tidris. Yeah. This is Tidris. Yeah. I invented Tidris. <laughs> That's what I, I got a medal for it. Wow. Okay. So, if you guys have seen the satellite that we've Hazi Center, it's right above yeah, the shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I yeah, asked around. So, good picture. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I guess I left that out. One of the key things in here was the multiple beams. Um, it had, we, we, we gave it two functions. By the way, this was designed by Jet Propulsion Laboratory because they were very good at three axis satellites. And this is a three axis stabilized satellite in synchronous orbit, okay? So this is about 50 feet across from here and 50 feet from here. And these two antennas communicate with the ground stations at White Sands. So the signal comes up from White Sands uh, to the TDRS. The TDRS relays it to the uh, operating satellite and the reflection comes back. You, you use the Goddard range and range rate to measure a four-way uh, distance and cancel out, and then you also have to measure the TDRS distance and subtract that out. It's all done at White Sands Proving Grounds. Um, this is a phased array. There are 30 elements here. And the problem was with vacuum tube site technology, you couldn't fly the electronics to build 30 beams, 30 pencil beams with it. So I came up with the idea I had been assigned 600 megahertz of bandwidth from the military band at KU band. I assigned 300 of that for data. So this was capable of transmitting 300 megabits per second back then, when the highest data rate we were using was about 16,000 kilobits. Okay? So 300 megabits per second. And then the other 300 megabits I divided into 30 channels, 10 megahertz each, assigned to each one of the elements, and coherently transmitted the output a after it had been picked up with a preamp, so now the signal to noise ratio had been established. Transmitted that on the 10 megahertz bandwidth to the ground, one for each element. And there we did the phasing 30 times. So there were 30 boxes built, three in a rack, by uh, Melbourne, by ha Harris Corporation at Melbourne. They got the contract for that. And so, then they came up, or we came up with the idea, actually, the, the, the testing of this, we simulated it with an outfit in Long Island, Air AIL, Airborne Instrument Labs. Airborne Instrument Labs builds the jamming equipment for fighter planes in, in, in a, a, a very sophisticated, I, I, I've visited all of this stuff. Um, they could be pinged by radar, 10 radars at the same time, and the software would identify an, each one separately and spook it by relaying a signal back that's longer time than reflecting off the, off the wings. Okay, so that, that gave them a spook antenna, a spook set rockets. That would cause the enemy to shoot in empty space. And, and so the AIL then built a simulation of this phased array system at S-band in the anechoic chamber. And that's, we've got those reports sitting over there. So that's why I brought the report so you could See how much effort we did in those days. After this, uh, yeah. I don't know, you guys can definitely come up here and yeah. 
pencil beads. So the, this produces 30 pencil beads with each beam individually tracking a user satellite that's below it. So that's the first TDRS, and it was a very sophisticated design. Anyway. Um, so, Ed, um, yeah. I want to give people more time to read through this. Um, the, the, the next panel is at 7.15, it's 6.30 now. So we can go for about another 15 minutes, then start asking questions and ask people Yeah, let's. Here. Going, flipping through all this All right, so th stuff. this morning I didn't hit the mini track system, but I thought it's very worthwhile because it's a unique method to track satellites and it just gets the angle, okay? Now, very shortly, I left NASA in 1974. I had 25 years of service, including one year in the Navy during World War II. And I got into the communication satellite. This is a communication satellite built by French, uh, because I was working with them at the time, Telecom 2. And so I, I, some of you don't, I don't know how much you know about them, but these two antennas are, let, let's say you want to transmit television programs. So you would transmit them and would be picked up by one antenna and then amplifiers located inside here, high power amplifiers, um, and, the, and initially there were 12, now we're up to at least 24. Yeah, pull it out. Um, so you can actually see a simulation of uh, where the electronics are done. And, I'm gonna leave this off so and, 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 and this is a, these are fuel tanks because when you put a satellite in, in synchronous orbit, it has a tendency to change its position. So about every 10 days you knock it back uh, positions are assigned every two degrees in the synchronous orbit. So you have to maintain it to plus or minus 0 0.05 degrees. And uh, so you need all these fuel tanks for that. Uh, the other one that, that requires a lot of fuel is the inclination angle of the orbit. It drifts out of the equator plane. And so to knock it back into the equator takes about 50 times more fuel then bumping it in horizontal method. So this is standard for almost every communication satellite. It look a bit like this. Solar panels for the high power. Transmitters now are at 200 watts. Um, we've changed, in the early days, they, uh, they assigned about six megahertz bandwidth to the band that was assigned to them. Today, with the, the technology of compressing the data for, for digital, satellite, digital communication. Um, each satellite now can transmit 160 channels, 10 channels per transponder, I'm sorry, 60, 16 channels per transponder. And uh, I got that backwards, but 160 channels by using compression. So that's the communication experience. I spent some time working with ComSat, with American Satellite Company, American Satellite Company involved. When, when TDRS was first designed, Congress wouldn't give us the money to build it. So each year we'd give study money out to the several companies out there. And uh, TRW, in the end, teamed with Western Union Western Union wanted to build a communication satellite, and TRW wanted to build a TDRS. So they put the two together, and so there's a package on the first three TDRSs that have 12 transmitters on them for the Western Union part of it. And uh, eventually, um, Western Union wanted to sell its half, and this hat I'm wearing, belongs to Continental Telephone Company. It teamed with Fairchild, and I was working for Fairchild, to buy a half interest in Tidris. So I'm back at Tidris. I was the guy that advised uh, – <coughs> shoot, forgot my word the, – the company that it would be a good thing to do. Uh, after I left them, 
they eventually built bought the whole satellite. And so talk a bit more into the mic and just kind of signal that it's a little quiet in the back. We're done? No, no, just talk more into the mic. Okay. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So um, Tidris had several lives in a sense. That's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, it was owned by the commercial industry for a number of years. And the Tidris part of, of service was uh, f lent out to, uh, to, 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 the, to the NASA. NASA rented it. Eventually, NASA got smart, bought the whole thing. Um, Continental Telephone was very happy. They got a big price. And now Tidris is, is, is Goddard's whole satellite. There's a whole building at Goddard Space Flight Center dedicated to Tidris designs. Um, every, did everybody get a look at when they, I've got also brought along these gadgets over here. And for, for those who didn't see it before, this is the nose tip of a Viking rocket that's recovered after it's been launched. Okay, it, fa it falls down into the white sands, so you see the white sand on it. That's gypsum, and the color, color there. I, I was in charge of the recovery party, so I took one home. <laughs> and this, this is a, um, a small jet motor that could be used after you've, after you've run out of fuel and rocket shoots up, burns up all the fuel, then these small ones are used to stabilize the rocket. Um, he was very familiar with that. So Go. that rocket engine apparently uses high test hydrogen peroxide to spray into a platinum catalyst. Here. Did, you, did you say that this uh, rocket motor used a uh, magnesium catalyst using a high test peroxide, like 90, 95% stuff? You definitely don't want to get on your hands. So, yeah. I, I made a challenge. When, he was at my house a couple of days ago, and I made a challenge. I says, what do you think this is? <laughs> this is a memory thing, core memory. Anybody? Earlier this morning, everybody loved it. So you, you're welcome to come up here and, and take a look at it. So that's core memory. This is a, a gun camera. It says gun camera. It's used on fighter planes. Um, so when the pilot <coughs> triggers his gun, this will record the shooting and, uh, and, and give him the confirmation that he really did shoot one down. So we use these. It's a 16 millimeter movie camera. And um, there were two of these. I'm going to give Joe one specific use of it. There were two of these on a Viking rocket. And you can look at a picture of the Viking rocket over here. Um, one was uh, with black and white, and the other was with color. And we recovered the camera, and the rocket had misbehaved. It, it, it was spinning very slowly. And as it did, it's precessed and would tip over. And as it did, it did a big scan of everything. So Otto Berg, one of our scientists, took the film, took every piece of 16 millimeter, pieced it together like a puzzle. And lo and behold, he had the first picture of a hurricane taken from a rocket. And the first time, I think we understood that a hurricane had that kind of formation. Um, it was half off of the US and half over Mexico at the time, a gigantic hurricane. It was published in Life magazine of 19, in 1955. The, the picture was taken in 54. It took him three months to put all that together. And I've been looking all over to try to find that particular one. There are thousands of pictures of hurricanes today, but that was the original one. So that, that was one of the outputs of the Vanguard program. Um, you, you had some. Yeah, I have some pictures of the ATS yeah. satellites. So. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, no, no go. Yeah, now, this is the first US satellite. Um, when uh, Russia put up Sputnik, um, Werner von Braun in, in Huntsville had been begging and begging to be the first one to put a satellite up. And, uh, he, and Eisenhower didn't want to make it a military uh, type launch, 
So he gave it to us at uh, Naval Research Lab to build the Vanguard satellite by a bunch of civilians. We did that, but we were going to be late. The first one blew up in, uh, on national TV. Um, so they quickly strapped this together with, a, I forgot its name, but it's equivalent to the V-2 rocket, the advancement of that one. So this became the second stage, a bunch of rockets, and this was the first stage with the experiment in it being a cosmic ray. And Van Allen was in charge of the cosmic ray detector. And uh, when they looked at the data, they found it had saturated the, the channel. And they said, oh my God, and that was the discovery of the Van Allen belt done by that rocket. So standing here is one of them, Ron Van Allen, is a picket, the first head of, of uh, JPL. Very happy people holding a, another rocket in, in the air. So that's, that, that was the first one there. We, we stand, we, we're the Vanguard, we meaning the Vanguard group, I'm part of that. We celebrate that, that our launch was on St. Patrick's Day. So every St. Patrick's Day, we all call each other on the phone and wish them happy, happy birthday for the Vanguard. The Vanguard satellite that finally succeeded has a perigee of 400 miles and an apogee of 2,000. And that, and it's a small ball. It was a test ball. It wasn't the real satellite. Uh, we'll be up there for several thousand years, is the prediction. We've torn down all of the interferometer tracking systems, and, and the transmitter and that, the battery gradually died. And uh, it's still up there, orbiting, can be tracked optically. Some people do it. So that's that story. Mine is after I left, I got into this communication field. And for three years, I was the chief engineer for a company called RIMSAT, which was buying uh, satellites from Russia, the Gorzon satellites. And uh, they, when, when communism died, all of the manufacturing plants became owned by the men who worked there. And so we made a contract for a half a dozen of them. And this is one of them. I'll still come up with the, with the rocket now. <laughs> um, so that's, this is uh, in Kazakhstan. And I took that picture in Kazakhstan of our first launch. On that. So from my career, I, I spent most of it out in the non-government world. So uh, over here is a picture of a TDRS satellite all folded up inside a shuttle. So you can see how big that is. E each year, the thing grew and grew till finally only the shuttle could carry it up. And I, the first TDRS misbehaved. And the, the, the third stage didn't fire, but they used the excess fuel that they had put in it to gradually move it up to synchronous orbit and it, and it finally worked. The second one was the one that blew up in front of everybody with the teacher in it. Uh, it the third one, I got invited to come down and watch the launch. This is me receiving an award uh, for two things that I did. One, I never mentioned it, but data processing was a big problem in the beginning. We had 100,000 reels of tape collected during the first couple of years, untouched, unprocessed, because we didn't have an automatic method. I was the only one with a tabletop computer, a Libroscope, and it had a drum memory, 4,000 words. So me and a my, huh? Got to go? Oh, no, I was giving a size comparison to the drum that you described. <laughs> um, a hard drive that looks like a barrel. How much was 4,000 words? Does anybody know? A, a, word, a word is usually, well, a word is a definition. It could be a byte, but usually it's two bytes, or it's 16 bits wide. Oh, on that, and this memory is 32 bits. Oh, so, yeah, so it could be 30, a word could Four be 32 bytes, bytes wide. Mm. 
Somebody has counted it and told me 32, but I, don't I would not count 32. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll count those later for you. <laughs> later. <laughs> I think it might be less. So I think it's less. <laughs> the first big memory, we, uh, big machine we bought at Goddard was called the 7090, and it was 1970. And it had a memory box that was the size of a refrigerator, one mega by one million <laughs> words, 64-bit words, nice. whole refrigerator. God. So, and were um, we proud <laughs> at the time. If, if someone in here wants a, a fun thing to look up about old hard drives, look up the old IBM RAM Act. Mm. Uh, it's, it's basically the first hard drive that works kind of like a modern hard drive does. Uh, and they actually, the, when you find the thing on YouTube, picture this being shown in a movie theater because they actually showed it there as like an advertisement. <laughs> wow. I think that uh, this exceeds that kind of storage. Yeah. <laughs> and it's being used as badges. So. Well, that's I mean, a megabyte. Yeah, one, there's 1. one megabyte. 1.4, one megabyte. Yeah. One and a half back. This was a refrigerator. <laughs> Once upon a time. You could, you could actually pull food with a floppy. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, um, you, you know what I have at home? One of these made into a letter opener. <laughs> <laughs> you should have just worn that. No one would. No, no, no one would have known. This, the reason I bring up the data is uh, that triggered them, and they made me the boss of data processing. That was 1962. We 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 built. Uh, boxes in-house, six of them, that would convert the analog tape, 10 racks of equipment, into digital computer style, where it's stop and go recording. So that's the first time. The, the problem with a satellite is it never shuts up. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you've got to record it all. And when you put it on tape, you can't stop the tape and say, wait, I, got, I, got, I want to look at that. It's continuous, so we have to have a way of moving to continuous into bursts, and that's that's what the computer is. Yeah. And so the, what the data processing thing was, it's a complete building, building 32. God, I built the building in, in six years. And uh, the, uh, we, we, we produced the science's data. There are 50 tape decks because a scientist has the right to his data for the first couple of years. So we have to break out the science stuff that's coming off the satellite into individual scientists. And then we add ancillary data, like where the satellite is, what its attitude is, and all of that stuff. And he gets these batched and on the tape. He has to have an IBM machine to read that tape. So, and UNIVAC is the one that won the contract, and I told him, you want a contract? You gotta be Mr. IBM. <laughs> so the next day he came in and said, We are IBM compatible. <laughs> and he got the contract. So that was data processing. So this little honor, I got a medal from the AIAA for both developing the TDRS, the, the data processing system. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and the TDRS technology. I never developed the TDRS satellite itself. That yeah. happened after I left. But the technology of the big antenna and the multiple beam were, were my ideas at the time. So the, the developing, you know, it was a unique idea. Do the phasing on the ground instead of in space. Mm -hmm. There actually have been 13 of these built, and three of them were built by Hughes that I know of, and they said, oh, we're going to do the multi-beam in the satellite, and they did. The subsequent work in contracts were, no, we're going to do it back on the ground. So it's where you can handle the machine. Um, do any questions? Yeah, do we want to go to questions and let people get a hand on some of the material? Uh, working with communication satellites, um, I'm just curious what you guys would use as a local oscillator on something like the beam. 30 beam uh, would be the local oscillator on the That local oscillator is what makes it coherent. Right. You transmit the 30 individual 10 megahertz 
frequencies that were generated from that os oscillator and the oscillator to the ground. So you, you have to all. Yeah, I'm just curious what's that sort of oscillator on which the phase noise? That as I am, I did the math on all that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of math. <laughs> and uh, it was coherent. Yeah. So it made it work. Well, Part of that reason for coherence is that that also applied in the interferometer. One interesting thing with the interferometer, we could track, um, there's a report here, uh, stars. The, the sun puts out noise. Noise is coherent if you pick up the same noise uh, at each antenna. So, and we, so every morning we would get the sun, every noon the sun would cross over and jam us at the interferometer, and then uh, the Milky Way, not the Milky Way, but, uh, our sister galaxy I'm shooting through. So we, me and another guy wrote a paper on that one, yeah. tracking a star. So, and I tried to sell that. Noise is coherent. 